Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NWCC webinar today. Um, we are just getting everything set up, and we're just about to begin. So looks like we're, we're right at noon Eastern time. Um, so just to start things off, uh, this is Paige Johnson with AWWI, American Wind Wildlife Institute, and I'm here with Ian Evans. And we're just going to introduce the webinar um, and let you know what the agenda looks like for today before we turn it over to Jocelyn Brown Saraceno from DOE to give a little bit of introduction about the projects. So today we are um, hosting the first of two webinars on the status and findings of developing technologies for bat detection and deterrence at wind energy facilities. And before we get started with the presentation today, I have a couple of quick notes on logistics. For sound, you should be able to hear us through your computer. If you are having any technical trouble with the webinar, please send us an email at info at awwi.org. You can also send us logistics questions through the Q&A box in the webinar room. We'll be doing Q&A sessions after each presentation. We have three presentations today. And so if you have a question for the presenters, please enter it in the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You will only be able to see the questions that you submitted in the box, not those submitted by others. Feel free to submit questions whenever they come up, whenever you think of them during the presentations. And after each presentation, we will read the questions out loud for the presenters to respond to as time permits. And finally, a reminder that we are recording this webinar today to post on the NWCC website along with the presentation slides. So the research you'll see presented in today's webinar is supported by a funding opportunity from the U.S. Department of Energy for bat impact minimization technologies and field testing opportunities. To tell you a little more about the background of these projects, I'll turn things over to Jocelyn Brown Saraceno with the U.S. Department of Energy. Jocelyn manages the market acceleration program, including the environmental research portfolio for DOE's Wind Energy Technologies Office. So I'll just pull up. Jocelyn's slides, and Jocelyn, as soon as you see those, Pete, please feel free to go ahead and start. Great. Thanks so much, Paige. Um, so as Paige mentioned, uh, all of the projects that you're going to hear about, um, both in the webinar today and in a sister webinar that will occur this Wednesday, were funded in part uh, by the U.S. Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technologies Office. And um, that, the, the Wind Energy Program within the U.S. Department of Energy works to invest in energy science research development and validation activities for U.S. land-based offshore and distributed wind power. Um, and we do so to help lower wind energy costs increase capacity, accelerate reliable and safe energy production, and also address environmental and human use considerations. And the portfolio that this work was funded under focuses on addressing site, uh, siting and environmental concerns and in order to improve the environmental performance of wind farms. And the work that we do here works to, um, excuse me, and work, still working on the slide advancement. We work to better understand and model risk um, and also to develop mitigation solutions. And the work that you're going to be hearing about today and also on Wednesday, Wednesday should you choose to participate in that webinar as well, really um, is focused on uh, technologies to reduce impacts on that. Um, and all of this work was funded through a 2015 funding opportunity announcement. And this funding opportunity announcement really was aimed at advancing the technical readiness of technologies, both to expand the number of unique technologies that are available for uh, development and testing, um, and also to support uh, the field testing and evaluation of more advanced technologies in order to ensure that there are both efficacious solutions and also cost-effective tools um, available for use. Uh, there were two topic areas under this solicitation. The first focused on those earlier stage technologies, really working 
to help advance the development of technology designs um, and to do some initial testing of those early prototypes. Um, the second topic area, which will be the focus of Wednesday's webinar, was um, focused on validation of uh, proposed minimization technologies. And the, the effort was really focused on doing that validation at a scale that would be sufficient to determine if there was a statistically significant reduction in impact. Um, at, and that topic area was really focused also on a cost analysis to ensure that there are cost-effective solutions. So there were three topic or three uh, proposals rather that were funded under that first topic area, and these are the three that you're going to hear about today. They really cover a range of different uh, novel ideas um, for reducing um, that impact at wind farms, and there were two. Uh, that projects that were funded under that second topic area, again, the focus of Wednesday's webinar. Um, and since these projects uh, were uh, awarded in 2015, the majority of these are still ongoing projects. So what you'll be hearing about today for the majority of these projects is um, interim progress reports and initial results. And stay tuned in the future for the, the final results from, from each of these projects, with the exception of the GE project, which you'll hear about on Wednesday, which is at this point complete. So on today's webinar, as Paige mentioned, um, there will be three talks. Uh, the first talk will be given by Dr. Amanda Hale, focusing on her um, and co-PI Tory, Dr. Tori Bennett's work um, to develop texturized wind to turbine towers in an effort to reduce bat mortality. Uh, Dr. Amanda Hale is an associate professor of biology at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. She earned her PhD in biology from the University of Miami and an MS in ecology and BS in biology from Purdue University. Dr. Hale's lab has been investigating wind wildlife issues since 2009. The second talk will be given by David Cooper, and he's going to be speaking about uh, frontier and wind efforts to develop rotor-mounted ultrasonic bat impact mitigation systems. Uh, David Cooper is a senior electrical systems engineer at Frontier Wind. He started out at, with Frontier Wind working on the very load system that actively changes the aerodynamics of wind turbine blades and has now moved on to the strike-free product of which he is the project manager. He has worked in the PLC safety systems field for the petrochemical and nuclear industries. And then the third and final talk today will be given by Dr. Paul Sievert. Uh, focused on his and his team's work to develop a biomimetic ultrasonic whistle for use as a bat deterrent on wind turbines. Dr. Siever is a research associate professor with the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He specializes in population modeling and conservation as it relates to rare species. Um, and with that, I want to thank you all for taking the time to attend, and I also want to thank the speakers in advance for their willingness to provide an update on their research. Um, and I'll pass the, the virtual microphone back over to Paige to um, kick off uh, Dr. Hale's talk. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. So um, we'll just load up the presentation, which takes just a second here. All right, so Dr. Hale, please take it away. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to um, hear about our, our project um, update. Um, uh, let's see here. So I'm going to tell you about some of our findings and try to provide an overview of our texturizing wind turbine towers to reduce bat mortality project. Um, this really has been a three-year project funded by the DOE, uh, but it really started before that with our partnership with NextEra Energy Resources. And so what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the project background and how we came up with the idea uh, for this technology that we, we were testing, um, provide just an overview of our technical approach and some of our key findings, and then wrap up with a project status um, and availability of our results. So I think first and foremost, we're all here today because large numbers of bats have been reported uh, to be killed at wind turbines globally, and there's increasing evidence that bats are interacting with turbine towers in a variety of ways. So we have videos showing bats exploring the, the tower monopole structures, the nacelles, and the non-moving um, turbine blades, 
And collectively, these flight patterns are suggestive of foraging behavior, roost investigation, mating behavior, and even drinking behavior. And so a sort of a summary of, of these observations and looking at bat fatalities, um, we really um, came up with our overall goal of our project, which is to develop a wind turbine tower coating um, that bats would show little or no interest in approaching to try to reduce the frequency of these investigative approaches and contacts of these tower structures. Um, we are looking for a coating that could be applied to currently deployed turbine towers as well as to towers as they are being constructed. Um, well hopefully, this, if it's uh, effective, this coating would be economically feasible to produce and apply and then ultimately contribute to a reduction in bat mortality at uh, wind, wind, onshore wind facilities. So sort of those, those pictures up there on the right show our visualization initially of sort of what kinds of textures could we, could we put on turbine towers with the uh, explicit intent of not making these towers look more like trees, but rather a uh, having sort of this disruptive surface. Uh, the target market would be existing wind farms, um, turbine manufacturers, and wind farm developers. And if successful, we initially envisioned that the commercialization efforts would focus on perhaps geographic areas with a high risk of bat mortality or areas with threatened and endangered species. And uh, uh, realizing that there are tens of thousands of land-based wind turbines currently op in operation in the U.S., that this might be sort of one additional tool in the mitigation toolbox that could be used to reduce bat fatality um, across the U.S. And so how did we come up with this idea? Uh, the texture coding is really based on what we're calling a water misperception hypothesis. So in 2010, Greif and Seamer published a paper um, that demonstrated that water recognition is innate in bats. And so bats don't learn to recognize water, but rather they ally, rely on information from echolocation in order to tell them that the surface is water or the surface isn't water. And they conducted a flight facility experiment. They brought uh, 22 different species of bats into a large um, enclosed area. And what they were able to show is that these bats exhibited repetitive drinking behavior on smooth surfaces, whether they were made of metal or wood or plastic, but these bats did not exhibit repetitive drinking behavior on any of the textured surfaces. And so they concluded that bats cannot effectively distinguish water from smooth surfaces. And so what you're sh we're seeing on the lower left-hand side are a series of three different spectrograms or pictures of a synthetic bat call played at different surfaces in their experiment, and then the returning echoes from those. So on the far left, the line that has an S, that's the synthetic bat call, and then G is the echo coming back um, in the first panel from water, and the middle panel from a smooth metal plate, and then the third from a textured metal plate. Um, that E symbol just is referring to an artifact off the edge of the water tray. But what they concluded is that the echoes coming back off of water and smooth metal were virtually indistinguishable, whereas the echoes coming off of textured metal were very different. And, um, um, surmise that this is how bats are actually identifying, identifying water sources. So when we saw this paper, we thought, well, let's gather some baseline data uh, where we are in Texas to see if this is actually something that could be contributing to bat fatalities. So the first thing that we did was conduct a playback experiment with synthetic bat calls, and uh, we played these at a range of surfaces, and we showed that smooth water surfaces produced echoes that were virtually indistinguishable from water. And so this result is, is consistent with the idea that yes, perhaps water misperception could be contributing to bat fatalities. Along at the same time, we also conducted a series of night vision surveys at uh, cattle ponds and turbine towers at the wind facility where we've been working. And what these results showed is that bats approach tower surfaces as they did ponds. And they would swoop in um, and make these headfirst contacts with the tower structure support, um, an approach that uh, was not dissimilar from bats drinking at water. So again, this observation of bats at smooth tower surfaces made us think that, OK, <laughs> maybe this is contributing to bat, fat bat fatalities. And then thirdly, uh, we came up with a, uh, an initial um, prototype of a flight room, uh, brought some uh, bat wild-caught bats into the flight facility to try to replicate these initial results of Greif and Seamers and actually document with bats that are killed at wind, at wind turbines in North America. Can we get them? Do we see the same response to smooth surfaces? And will they attempt to drink from those? And the results from those preliminary surfaces were, again, yes. So consistent with this water misperception hypothesis, these bats would drink from, attempt to drink from smooth surfaces, but not from any of the textured surfaces um, that, we, that we used in our studies. The other part that could be contributing to this effect of smooth towers and how it impacts uh, bat activity um, at wind facilities is, is due to this idea called the acoustic mirror effect. 
And so what we see in some bat species is that detection of surface-based prey um, using echolocation is actually enhanced or facilitated by smooth backgrounds, such as water surfaces or smooth leaves. And so these bats are able to perceive these prey items um, and have high foraging efficiency. Um, we know that bats in some instances can switch foraging strategies when it's efficient for them to do so. And so it is possible that bats are experiencing um, higher foraging efficiency for prey items that are around these smooth tower surfaces. Uh, for this hypothesis, though, to be feasible, uh, these prey items must be on or very close to the turbine tower surfaces themselves. And then the bats that are killed at wind turbines, these aerial hawking uh, bats who are catching prey while in flight, would need to be able to switch from this aerial hawking uh, foraging strategy to a gleaning um, strategy at these wind turbine tower surfaces. So based on those sort of preliminary observations, we submitted a research proposal uh, to the DOE. Um, and now I'm just going to walk you through sort of our technical approach um, and some of our key findings um, over the past several years. So our first two tasks in 2015 and 16 were really uh, were working hand in hand. So one of those was to develop a texture coating that could be applied uh, to a wind turbine tower. And the second was to enhance our behavioral experiments in, in a flight facility and try to get the situation more similar to what a bat might be experiencing at a wind turbine tower. Um, so I guess from the flight room experiments in 2015, um, going from that flat uh, horizontal uh, surface to a curved surface, which is more similar to a turbine tower, we wanted to again find out will bats attempt to drink um, from this surface. Uh, for this set of experiments, uh, we had five eastern red bats and 36 evening bats. And the results of these studies showed that these bats would attempt to drink from the smooth surfaces, but not from the textured surfaces that we were creating in the flight facility. So again, the findings from this first phase of experiments were consistent with this water um, perception hypothesis. Um, we then uh, sort of revised our scope of work in partnership with the DOE, and we decided that based on those results, we needed to do a second round of flight experiments with wild-caught bats with uh, these plates in a vertical orientation. And so we had both flat and, and curved plates that we used in the second round of flight experiments. And we also conducted a feasibility study at smooth turbine towers, really going back out to the field and trying to get an understanding of what was the best setup and approach for watching bats at these towers so that if we felt it was worthwhile to go forward to a, a field test, uh, we'd be in a good position to, to um, sort of have our response variables identified and to be uh, watching as many bats as we could possibly see. OK, so this is showing you as, uh, the setup of our flight facility with these uh, vertical surfaces. On the back wall are smooth and texture treated uh, flat plates that are hidden behind a sheet in this current picture. And then what you see in the middle of the room is a mock turbine tower. One side of the tower is smooth. The other has this texture coating that we developed in task two. And then we would all go out and catch bats and mist nets and bring them into the flight facility and see how they responded to these different surfaces, alternating between the flat and the curved ones. Uh, we have identified two response variables for this experiment. We were really looking at the number of passes uh, by the bats within a one meter from the turbine uh, or from these, these surfaces, sort of this close investigative behavior. And then we are also looking for contacts with those surfaces. And so if we look at the eastern red bat data, in this case, we had 16 different bats we were able to bring into the flight room and run through the trials. And what we observed is they made significantly fewer passes at the texture treated compared to the smooth surfaces. And in general, uh, the species made very few contacts with any of the vertical surfaces in the flight facility. What you can see over on the right are the 95% confidence intervals for the differences in their responses to the texture treated and smooth surfaces. And so for those flat surfaces, we found anywhere from about 26 to 13 fewer passes per 10 minute interval within the flight facility. And at the curved surface, we found from three and a half to one a fewer passes in that same in, in that 10 minute interval period. If we look at the results for the evening bat, we had a sample size of 36 individuals who, who went through the trials. Uh, we also found for this species significantly fewer passes within one meter of the texture treated compared to the smooth surfaces. And then also the data aren't shown here, but this species made significantly fewer contacts with the texture treated compared to the smooth surfaces. And then again, what you see on the right are these 95% confidence intervals of the reduction in passes and this activity close to the surfaces when they were texture treated compared to smooth. And so the results from, from this experiment were again consistent with our hypothesis that bats are, are spending more time investigating in close to the smooth surfaces compared to texture treated. And so simultaneously, 
uh, we were up at our, uh, our study site, which is a wind facility in north central Texas. And this, this feasibility study was really designed to, uh, to answer two questions. And it's one, to, to refine our approach of how are bats interacting with the smooth tower surfaces, about how many bats are present, what might our expected sample size uh, be, and what types of behavior do they exhibit? How do they enter and exit the field of view? Um, how can we categorize their activity with respect to contacting the tower, being near range or far range? And then uh, the second part is really the technological side. So what was the best setup for our high definition cameras, night vision technology, thermal cameras, the ultrasonic bat detectors, et cetera? And so we had initially envisioned being able to put the texture uh, coating on, on one each of three to five pairs of turbines. And so in late uh, midsummer, we were out watching um, these towers. And on 21 nights at just three of the pairs, uh, we observed 171 bats with our cameras and recorded 181 bat calls. And so at all of the pairs that we had included for our study, we saw bats interacting with the turbines in a variety of way. And this is just showing you one of the metrics that we were looking at. So across the, uh, the horizontal axis, you can see data for the turbines in pair one, two, and three. And then what's showing for the bats that we observed, how many of those were far range. And those are bats that we consider to be close to the towers, but not directly interacting with those surfaces. The close range are then in that, that mid range. And then the black uh, parts of those bars show actual contacts uh, with those turbine towers. And so from the results of, of this analysis and some others, uh, we went ahead and refined our protocol for our field test in 2017. And so our last three tasks were <laughs> to apply the coding application to the turbine towers, and then to go out and evaluate bat activity um, at smooth and texture treated turbines simultaneously, and then the final analysis and report writing. Um, so in 2017, we were able to complete the texture coding application uh, to two turbine towers um, at our study site. So what you can see on the far left side of the slide is a piece of the test plate from our experiments in the flight facility, and then a test application low down on a turbine tower to really try to make sure the coating that we were proposing to put up on the turbine towers was matching the coating that we had developed and tested in the flight facility. And then what you can see in the first of the two larger pictures to the right is the application of the base coat on the turbine tower. And then on the right, it's showing what that, that coating application looks like once the top coat has been applied. And so we really, um, we kind of picked um, a compromise, I guess, on where we were putting the coating application um, for this trial. We didn't uh, have a budget sufficient to cover the entire turbine tower and to go all the way up into the nacelle. And so we picked a compromise given that our, our uh, cameras and our recording equipment were on the ground. We started the coding application about 10 meters up off the ground and then extended the coding application up into the rotor swept zone, um, knowing that this is where we were seeing bats um, interacting with the turbine tower um, would allow us to hopefully see as many bats as we could um, in the subsequent observations. So we completed bat activity surveys at these two pairs of turbine towers from May through September um, 2017. And again, our prediction is that bat activity would be higher at the smooth compared to texture treated. And so from all of the video analysis and the acoustic recordings, we have uh, detailed information about how bats are approaching and then exiting those field of views, and then the behaviors they're exhibiting and where along the turbine tower uh, we're seeing, seeing this kind of activity. So on the left-hand picture, what you see is an example of a bat making contact with the smooth turbine tower surface. And you can see the shadow of the bat uh, reflected off of that, that smooth surface. And then over in the right, in this particular image, you can really see the, the texture coating there and a the bat that's passing by and not making contact with it. So from all of these, these data, we actually started the surveys in May to just try to get some baseline activity at the smooth sap the smooth towers. Again, you've got a new field crew, new students involved, um, and that allowed us to sort of get up and running prior to the coding application. And then we continued with these methods um, into um, the early fall period. And so what you can just see here is we recorded um, over 1,200 bat calls at turbine towers during the survey, survey period. Uh, all of the seven species that are ha we've detected acoustically at Wolf Ridge, uh, we observed um, in close proximity to both our smooth and texture treated um, turbine towers in this year. So lots of bats calling around these turbines. And then what we also see is quite a few bats interacting or flying by uh, these turbines in close proximity. So the, the graph on the left is showing the two pairs of turbines, um, T23 and T25. T25 was the texture treated of that pair. 
and then the other pair is 260 and 263, and 263 was texture treated in that pair. And so there were uh, much lower levels of bat activity in May and June, which is what we've been uh, observing at uh, this wind facility over the years that we've been watching bats. And then what you can see in the right panel are the numbers of bats observed at these turbine towers in that post-texture uh, application period. So we saw Amanda, over uh, 1,000. Um, yes. Excuse me, Amanda, sorry. We've just had a couple people say they're having a little trouble hearing you. Could you oh. try speaking up just a little bit, please? Sure. I also just increased the volume. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Thank oh, you very much. Is this better? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. OK. Um, so during this uh, observation period, we observed just over 1,000 bats at the turbine towers during the survey period. Again, the lowest part of these bars is that far range activity, so bats that are, aren't coming in um, into that within a meter or, or touching the tower. The next level up in those bars is the number of bats in, in less than one meter. And then what you can see at the top is there are very few um, observations of bats contacting either the smooth or the texture treated turbines um, during this time period. And so to wrap up sort of on the project status and the availability of our results, um, our final technical report is due to the DOE this week, so we're going to be submitting that to them. Uh, we then anticipate there being a period of review with, with questions and comments back, and so our final results from the overall project will be available um, sometime later this spring. And then our goal for publication in peer-reviewed journals would be to submit the results from the texture coding development process and the flight room trials um, in this, this year, in 2018. And then we're currently working with NextEra uh, to develop a study plan for a possible second season of bat activity surveys at these experimental towers. Uh, we feel there could be real value added in an additional season of watching bats. Um, it's going to increase our sample size of nights, hopefully our sample size of bats, and really allow us to more fully understand uh, what effect, if any, there is on this texture coding um, on bat activity at, at turbine towers. And then pending the outcome of these results, uh, we will continue to work with our research partners to determine if a larger uh, scale field test is necessary while simultaneously working on potential uh, commercialization efforts. And there we are. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for that great presentation on this technology and the status. If anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box, and we'll read them out loud. And the first question that we had come in um, that, uh, Amanda, you are welcome to answer, or Jocelyn, if you'd like to answer this question, is just to tell us a little bit more about what low TRL and high TRL mean. Sure, I can take that, Amanda, if that's OK with you. Yes, that'd be great. So TR, and apologies, this is this may have been an issue with me using acronym speak. Um, so techno a TRL stands for technology readiness level, and technology readiness level is um, a means of um, categorizing uh, the the technical. Um, status of a technology, and it ranges all the way from, um, uh, it's a scale uh, that goes from uh, all the, from uh, one to nine, uh, and it uh, starts with just kind of this very early conceptual stage all the way up to commercialization. Um, and so the projects that you're hearing about today are earlier in that sort of tech development um, cycle in which they are uh, a number of the projects that you're hearing about today started as, as uh, these projects started as kind of proof of concept or early prototypes. Uh, where the researchers um, had a scientific basis for uh, believing that their approach might minimize uh, impact um, to bats at wind farms, uh, but needed to do the research and development in order to really prove out that concept. And Amanda, great. feel free to chime in if you want to add anything to that. Yep, that was great. Thanks, Jocelyn. Yeah, thanks, Jocelyn. Um, our next question is, was there a decrease in the number of bats killed between textured and non-textured surface? We haven't, um, we didn't try to test that um, in this case. One is we only have two turbines that are treated, and the extent of the coating does not extend all the way up into the rotor swept zone. And so what we would imagine if 
uh, we're able to gather more data. If there's an idea that this is this would be worth testing at a larger scale experiment, I think that would be a logical next step. Would be to apply some sort of texture coating to the nacelle, the monopole tower support of a larger number of turbines. So that could entail considerable cost at this this stage of the game, and then conduct a fatality um, study at those texture treated and controlled turbines. And again, those that would be a pretty um, um, time and intensive uh, endeavor itself, but a, ne a logical next step. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you believe the coatings are an effective means for batch deterrence based on the experimented, experimental data collected? I think at this point, um, it's hard to say. I think that's what we want to continue to look through. Um, all of the data that we collected, um, have discussions with DOE, with our research partner, and then come back and say what that next step should be. I think based on the flight room activity where you've got bats in a small, a small environment, how they respond to those two surfaces is different. Uh, I think the important question, the one I, that I think is asked is, does that then translate into an effect uh, with wild uh, free-flying bats? And we don't yet know that. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, could you go back over the last graph um, on the last slide with the, the last graph on the right? What's the meaning of the textured fill of the second and fourth columns? Um, those those um, textured fills are meant to represent that that is the textured um, tower. In, in that pair. So if, for example, T23 and T25 were one pair of turbines close in space at the wind facility. Um, T25 was texture treated, T23 was not. And we have a, another question regarding this slide. It says, the final slide seems to show more bat activity post-texture than pre-texture. Is that correct? Um, I'd hate Yes, so the observations of bats were greater at T25, and they were less at T63. Um, so there's also um, some question in terms of how the, the coating was applied to those two towers. T25 was the first tower that we, that we attempted this on. T63 was the second one. And so we're still going through um, those final analyses to really figure out what's the best way to tease, up, tease apart the effects of the actual coating applied on those individual towers. Um, and then the activity that we see. I think for this particular result, um, most of the activity is bats that aren't interacting with the towers themselves. And so uh, I feel like it's really that, that small bit of the bar that's really hard to see. Those few observations of bats that are actually contacting the towers um, is, is really the, the key here. OK, great. Uh, next question is, was there consistency among species on how they reacted to the textured surfaces? Um, we're not sure. So of the, the species that we're able to capture in mist nets and bring into the flight facility, the overall response of eastern red bats, which are commonly found at, in post-construction fatality searches in North America, and also the evening bat, which is also found in, in uh, post-construction fatality um, studies, but not in as great of numbers, for those two species, one migratory tree bat, one not a migratory tree bat, we saw um, similar behaviors. For the acoustic activity, we see the same general pattern of we have eastern red and hoary bats and silver-haired bats, which are, are killed in high numbers at wind facilities across North America. They are active at the wind facility, active around the turbines, and then there are also four other species that we had present. The challenge in answering that question in the field, however, is when we look at these bat observations at turbine towers is we are not uh, able to definitively say for any bat that we observe, oh, that bat is a hoary bat, that bat is an eastern red bat. And so what we can do with the acoustic data is do some call matching. And if we, we record an acoustic call within a very short time period of seeing a bat, it could be that bat, but perhaps we, it, it may not be. The acoustic call may come from a bat that's somewhere near the recorder, and the bat up, up at the turbine tower may not be detected. So that's the one downside right now with the technology and watching bats at turbine towers is we're not able to get a species identification based on watching them uh, with the current technology that we have. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have time for maybe one or two uh, more quick questions. Could you just um, reiterate what 
period of time you looked at um, bat activity for. One of the questions was asking if you looked at it in the fall where there might be higher bat activity. Sure. What we see at our site, and is similar to the patterns across North America, is we get highest levels of bat fatality uh, from late summer through early fall. So that would be from July through September. At our site, bat activity, um, whether it's acoustic or our um, <laughs> one measure of it is bat fatality, it tends to drop off uh, quite dramatically after um, September 15th or so. And so in this year, that was really our focal period of when we see the most bats, when we hear them um, at the wind facility, and also when we have done fatality searches when we find them. So it is during that high risk period of that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we are out of time for questions on the webinar for this presentation. We have a few other questions that have come in. So if we have time at the end, we'll circle back to those. And if not, then we'll make sure that um, we're sending those questions to you, Amanda, and we can follow up with those offline. So thank you. Um, and so next, we're going to have David Cooper speaking. And I will pull up your presentation, David. All right, thank you. And as soon as you see the slides, oh, there we go. Please feel free to go ahead. All right, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. It's good to be here, and it's good to participate in this discussion, and hopefully we'll learn a lot and be able to further the uh, causes for the environment. Anyway, um, as, as was previously stated, I work with Frontier Wind. Um, Frontier Wind is an outgrowth of, and has worked in the wind industry for a long time, and it is an outgrowth of, well, um, our investor um, had wind turbines in the Palm Springs area and so on, so it was very early in the 80s that got into this, and so we have quite a bit of background into wind turbines and so on. And they varied in, in um, application, but uh, right now we're working on the what we call the strike-free system. Now, as we look at the industry, and as many of you are probably aware, the industry has many pain points and pressures from all sides. I mean, you have environmental issues that we have to deal with, yet we need to have uh, plenty of production for return on our investment. Um, cost of energy can be an issue and uh, regulation. So the owners and operators have a lot of um, things to balance and work through. Um, <clears throat> some of the environmental issues, of which one of the reasons is why we're here, of course, is with bats and also the birds, so particularly raptors and so on. But we're, we've been focusing on the area of bats because we come up with a technology that um, works well with bats. Um, bats, as you know, are they're, they're environmentally protected. At least we have the um, one species, the Indiana bat, that is endangered. And of course, we have 11 species that are threatened or headed to endangerment and so on. So this has been a big concern, and this is one good reason of what the DOE is doing, I think, is uh, trying to look out for our environment and, and head off any potential problems that we may have in the future. Now, we're also working with the CEC, which is the California Energy Commission, who is also concerned about things like that. And of course, being in, in many of our food products, being one of the bed bread baskets of the country or the world, um, you want to make sure that your um, insects and so on are, are controlled. And of course, bats are an important part of that, too. And um, I know there's some statistics that state that in the US, we have nearly 1 million bats killed each year. And being that bats aren't as prolific as some other species are, this can be a concern, because we don't want to see a dwindling population of bats that could cause other environmental impacts to us. From an operator's perspective, um, spinning turbines means revenue generation, right? Standing turbines mean no, no revenue. And so um, some of the bat mitigation prod, um, ideas or regulations can involve curtailment and so on. And of course, when you have curtailment, you're not generating the energy you want, and that can also throw your bottom line into disarray as if you're not generating the power that you need. Um, 
so there are certain take permits that are often issued or and increased scrutiny in the industry due to bat kills and, and other kills. Um, and in many cases, there are limits that you can't exceed, right? And so exceeding those limits can stop the turbines um, or at least get them into curtailment, but they can actually stop them if they've killed their quota of bats. So there are research permits that are available and so on. And those permits go around year, around the year. And um, so we need to mitigate um, well, we, in, during migration, there can be issues, and even during non-migration. So if you run the, into your quota early in the year, you can have curtailment for the rest of the year, and that can be a problem, too. Um, and of course, um, a lot of the migrations happen at the uh, latter part of the year, typically. Um, so this can be, there can be quite some complicated algorithms to forecast when and how to shut down machines if you're running into these kind of issues. So the problem is actually, um, or, or curtailment is actually a horrible solution in many ways because you reduce production and you, your cost of energy is higher and you know future development that could be an issue and return on in existing investments could be an issue. Um, so the industry doesn't really have a good solution until today. We are pretty excited about um, the solution that we are working on, and I um, think it brings a lot to the uh, to the industry. So when we were looking at this, the technical inputs for the strike-free system, as, as we were developing, we realized that every turbine is slightly different. And um, as I say, we've been in that industry for a while and seen the progression of smaller turbines, even open frame turbines we've worked with, open frame towers, I should say, um, and you can see as the size of the turbines are growing bigger and, and bigger, I mean, right now, what you have a, a rotor that's the diameter of a football field pretty much rotating around there in the sky, which is pretty impressive sizes that are involved here, which um, obviously we needed to be able to incorporate solutions for all of these different turbines. Um, systems need to be uh, species flexible because there are a number of species out there and every bat species can act differently and slightly differently and so on. Systems must be capable of addressing multiple species on a given site because um, most sites will have multiple species so we, and our system can target those certain areas. Um, we must address uh, strike and trauma kills obviously that's our big goal here. Um, barotrauma, of course, is one of them. That's, of course, the um, as there are vortexes and various pressure differentials that are generated off of the wind turbines, um, those can damage the bat's uh, lungs and so on, and there can be internal bleeding and so on. Um, that's there. I mean, to take an analogy, you could think about if you if any of you are scuba divers. Um, you, you know that uh, when you are coming up from great depths, you want to make sure that you're exhaling, otherwise you can blow your lungs up, right, or have some severe damage. Um, and bats are even more susceptible to those kind of uh, situations. Studies have been done on that, and you can read um, articles online on that. Um, the systems must deal with the, the attenuation of physics, too. I mean, when you're dealing with ultrasounds, there's quite a bit, uh, there's an attenuation line that is followed on that, and you can look those up, too. Um, but um, sound, getting sound out to a reasonable distance can be challenging at times. And so I believe our system addresses that issue quite well. Um, also, you must resist dirty power in the wind turbines too. So, you know, when you're when you're working in wind, in wind turbines, there can be a variety of of quality as far as the power goes. And we ran into one of those issues, which we'll probably uh, mention a little bit later in the in the presentation. But um, adapting your system to the variety of different uh, wind turbines and being robust enough to handle um, noisy power um, is an important thing. Um, we must be retrofitable 
to impact the existing fleet. Um, our system is very retrofitable, and that's the good part about it. It could be put on original OEM turbines, or we can um, put it in, install it into existing turbines on the field, in the field. Um, we should also have an easy way to communicate and to be able to determine, of course, that the system is live and actually doing uh, the functions that we would like to it to be doing and intend it to do, so that we are protecting the bats at all times. So, um, as I say, um, our system we're calling Strike Free. Um, it's the world's only uh, blade-mounted deterrent system. And as you can see in this diagram, um, we have distributed our transmitters, ultrasonic transmitters, down the uh, blade. They're um, actually on the um, suction side of the blade, on the, on the um, trailing edge there, um, and they're distributed. So going back to my previous comment, um, these turbines are getting very large, and the attenuation of ultrasonic sound um, through those distances can be pretty significant. Therefore, the distribution of the transmitters along the blade uh, makes fun installs, too. But anyway, looking at some of the technical approaches, um, we're to invent and design and fabricate an ultrasonic uh, bat deterrent and acoustic system that treats the entire wind turbine. And here you can see a graphic that kind of illustrates. Uh, you know, there are some other solutions out there that have looked at this and have had either tower mounted or nacelle mounted. Um, and as you can see, especially like in, in the case of a nacelle mounted section, the relative areas that are covered um, in that regard using, um, you know, equivalent sound levels from each of those locations. You can see that when we um, distribute it along the blade, we get better coverage out towards the tips. And of course, the tips are really where um, a lot of the, uh, well, the tips are running at a higher speed, right? Because it's the further furthest diameter out from the center. Um, but anyway, the whole idea is to cover that whole area so that any bats um, wandering into the area can be warned and uh, jammed and warned about the situations that are coming up. Um, so finding a cost-effective way of, and a flexible way of uh, covering that whole rotor swept area is, is what our mission was and, um, and what we've been working on. So as mentioned earlier also, there is targeting a number of species and this system is, um, flexible and configurable. That's the key to key points about this system. It's flexible and configurable. And so you've got a lot of different bats in different areas. You can um, customize the system to cover certain species if you want. You could use a general pattern if you wanted, but in, in many cases you could customize it so that you can focus more of your energy and delivering more of your power to the uh, regions uh, most effective based on the particular location that you're in. So what we have done is we've gone ahead and we've developed um, proprietary approaches to this. Of course, we also have uh, patents and uh, protection. So um, starting out with the transmitter design, you can see a picture of the transmitter design in the center top section. You can see the uh, very low profile that we have so that we do not affect the um, aerodynamics of the blade so that um, we can still have efficient and, and well-functioning blades and yet still deliver the, um, the signal at the location desired. The mounting is relatively easy too and relatively non-intrusive. You can see one small screw hole mount there and then um, adhesives and so on used to and, here to the blade, and different techniques can be used depending on on whether it's being impl um, implemented at the OEM level or original install versus uh, pre-existing installs. Um, we can use oper uh, we use our operational um, experience, being that we've worked on wind turbine blades in the past, 
in um, where, as I mentioned earlier, that we um, worked on um, adjusting the aerodynamics of a blade based on sensors and then actuators that could uh, make um, you know make changes to the aerodynamics. So. What I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we do have quite a bit of experience in implementing and working around uh, wind turbines and their blades, and that's been advantageous to us in, in this particular project. This particular project involves a lot of disciplines all coming together, and sometimes even one individual has to cover the breadth of all of these different areas. Of course, no man's an island, and um, there have been lots of people that have been very helpful, including the wind turbine site that has been tremendously uh, helpful and has a lot of foresight in the industry, realizing that um, you know we need to deal with these issues before they become a real problem to our environment. Um, so um, we did some uh, ultrasonic modeling, as you can see. That's uh, that colorful portion of the picture showing you distributions of sound, uh, wind turbine blade in the middle, and, and propagation of sound, and so on. Um, if you look at the picture on the uh, right, that's showing you um, the controller box, and um, which mounts readily in the hub of the turbine. So basically, uh, power is transmitted across a slip ring from the nacelle to the, to the hub. And so a lot of our work is done in the hub. So those of you that haven't been up in a wind turbine, it's kind of a, an amazing thing when you first go up and you realize, wow, this place, you know, I could stand up in these hubs, you know, and you can get a few people in these hubs. These things are massive. And to, but to work in those all day is somewhat cramped, too, but we have managed to package things so that they will fit in there easily and you can still move around the nacelle and, and service and so on can be taken care of um, and um, so on. As I mentioned, we have IP protection. We're looking at, uh, you know, transmitter location and and as far as the frequency management and so on, dealing with customizing for certain bands. Oh, there was a little animation for you, if you could see it. I don't know whether your screens refresh fast enough. <laughs> All right, and so then wrapping up with this, we're looking at some of the issues in the field. Okay, so uh, we had some issues as I alluded to earlier, with the power supply failing due to dirty power in the wind turbines. And um, there are a number of things that are going on in a wind turbine, a lot of high-powered uh, devices that are used, some with um, a lot of inductance. And so there are things like um, actuators and, uh, that um, work with the hydraulic system and some of those have a significant amount of inductance. And if those of you in the electronics industry or electrical industry understand how disruptive turning on or turning off inductors can be. And so we've had to deal with some of those um, power filtering issues and so on. If you look in the center, you'll see what was um, you could that was our original uh, portion of our original power supply. It looks more like a Swiss watch, right, in, in size, whereas if you look at the bottom uh, left, you've got more like a closer to a Sherman tank, I guess, of a power supply now. So um, that's one of the improvements that we've made in the system, making it more robust, actually being able to look, deliver more power, too, so we have more configurability of the system, too. We can reach higher powers if necessary. Um, that's in version 2 that we're working on. Um, you know, even version 2, um, we had to do a round on version 2 but we have now successfully had it up there operational for five months um, with the, the power supply operating for five months. We just checked it last month, and the, well, actually the 16th, not the 15th, but um, and things are looking good as far as that goes. So um, I think we are now to move into Q&A. Okay, excellent. Thank you for your presentation and we've had a number of questions come in. The first one, I'll go ahead and ask this question because it's related to what you were just talking about. You touched on this a little bit, but could you talk a little more about how the electronics have held up in a real world turbine environment? Okay, yes. 
Yeah, the, and my, here the main concern that we had had was um, we had issues with the power supply, right? And so dirty power and, and dealing with filtering, dealing with suppression and so on was an important element of the design. Now also dealing with waterproofing of various areas like uh, transmitters, um, we are currently working on improving that also. So um, those are the areas of, of main concern. Now heat can also be a concern, um, being that we are actually in northern part of California, but we still get pretty hot summers even in that area. So as you noticed in the controller, there were a lot of heat sinks covering the outside of the box because there's a lot, you know, there's a fair amount of power that's being dissipated through that system. And so managing uh, thermal considerations is something that we've had to deal with. Thank you. That goes in right into our next question, which is what is the failure rate of the ultrasonic transmitters since these are subject to strong vibrations? Yes, um, I don't have good numbers on that at this point because not all of that has been analyzed. We are, as I mentioned with the transmitters, we are going to a different, uh, we are improving the design because there was a fair amount of water ingress, significant percentages of water ingress on that. And um, the sealing mechanism that had been used was rather short and, and not adequate. So the intent would be that we would replace all of those um, and, and then do a test and then I'll have better numbers for you on. But at this point, uh, water ingress did become an issue, which um, seems like a pretty simple thing and was surprising to me that we had water ingress, but for some reason we did. And so that has been um, mitigated at this point or, or has been addressed, I should say. Great, thank you. The next question is, could you speak to whether the system efficacy has been demonstrated in the field? Hmm. Yeah, um, and I didn't really get into our future plans and should have got into that. Um, we, are, we are targeting this next fall as being the test for the system. And so that would be in the um, August, September timeframe, both months, August and September, we'd be running for both months. And um, then we should have good data. We were not able to get sufficient data due to the power outages we had due to the dirty power and the power supply failures. So that um, was a disappointment. And now this, this year we've got that resolved, so um, we should be able to get better data for you at that point. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, how does the strike-free system manage for increased risk to lightning due to the installation along the blade and other potential damage to the blade? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we, we have lightning at the site that we're located at quite frequently comes through. In fact, I've been working up tower and have been called down because of lightning on, on a number of occasions. So, um, so yes, that can be an issue. Now, have I identified any issues with lightning on our existing system? No, I have not. I have not seen a, a case of lightning striking our system and taking it out. <coughs> the mitigation or the design constraints that we adhered to for that were we worked with the manufacturer as far as there are lightning receptors, as many of you know, on a wind turbine, typically one at the tip. Sometimes there's one back a few uh, meters from the tip. Um, this one has both, the one that we're in right now, has both receptors in both locations. So our transmitters do not extend past that tip receptor. And in fact, they're at least two meters back from the original, from the um, outboard most um, receptor. And then we also space ourselves out two meters from the 
inboard receptor also. So we allow the main lightning system to carry the load. Now, in addition to that, our the gauge of our wire is pretty um, is a relatively small compared with the down conductor used in the lightning protection system. So therefore, the current most of the current it gets directed down the main lightning conductor. Um, we do have on board um, transorbs, where devices called transorbs that will take um, energy from um, ESD type energy, which lightning is an ESD type of event, um, and um, and shunt that energy to ground. So that is also built in. Um, as at the point where the the harness or the wiring that goes out to the transmitters enters the box or enters the board, lands on the printed circuit board. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, where is the where is the power supply installed, and on what type of turbines were the systems installed? All right, yeah. They are in, so the power supplies are installed in the hub, and there are mounting plates available inside the hub, and that gets to this particular one with the, being a, a Siemens turbine, a 2.5 megawatt class um, turbine. And uh, yeah, the, the power supplies, as I say, power comes across the slip ring, and, and then the, we take power from the sources in the hub, and the um, power supplies are just mounted on plates in the, in the hub. Great, thanks. Um, and the next question is, what data is available that demonstrates that the system actually deters bats? Yeah, good, good question. You'll find in the in the industry that um, this technology has been tested out land-based, which of course is a whole lot easier than dealing with in wind turbines, right? Because in wind turbines, you've got to shut them down. Therefore, cut their production is cut and so on. And and also, it's a lot more difficult working uh, what 300 feet in the air or so on, or anyway, hundreds of feet in the air. So. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah I, I don't, is there any, did I answer that sufficiently? Can you repeat that, please, the question again? I was asking, what, what is the data available that demonstrates that the system actually deters bats? Yeah, right. So, as I was saying, there, there are some, there have been some industry studies where they have, um, done some land-based studies across like ponds and so on, and they can see that they repel bats. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't actually done all of that. We have, because of the power supply failures, we were not able to prove that yet at this point. But we are confident that it does work because we've seen it on land-based, we've seen studies on land-based systems that take care of that. And um, our technology uses um, varying um, frequencies, and the frequencies can be um, multiplexed together, et cetera. So there are a lot of varieties that we can use to that can mix up the bat signal. So we anticipate being that we are more local and, uh, in other words, distributed, so we're getting the sound out to where we need to, that we should be able to have, you know, potentially even an improvement over the results that were seen earlier. Now, uh, numbers that we're seeing have been published in the industry, I believe, are like 50% reduction based on the land-based thing. Hopefully we get something more than that because we're getting out to the tip, so we're getting a lot closer, and the bats are getting more advanced warning to this. But at that this point, that's about all I can say to address that question, I think. All right, well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions for this presentation. We have had a number of other questions come in, so David, if you um, are, are up for it, I'll make sure to connect you with uh, the questions and the folks who ask those questions after this webinar, and we can respond to those by email. All right, thanks. Great, thank you. So next up we have
Paul Sievert, Dr. Paul Sievert, and I will load your presentation, Paul. All right, so please go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Paige. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Thanks. <laughs> that sounded like maybe too loud, but uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, so I will give you an update on our um, project looking at basically an ultrasonic whistle uh, to deter bats from wind turbines. So it's, it's kind of similar to David's um, uh, concept, except uh, this is not powered by electricity, but these would be passively blown whistles. So I'll walk you through um, our results. But I'll start out by just reminding you that um, we know that ultrasound has the um, uh, potential uh, to basically keep bats away from turbines. We know that bats re react to ultrasound emitted by moths and so forth. And I also want to, before I get too far along, show you the team uh, that I represent. Uh, the top row uh, here are the engineers at UMass, Yaya, Banache, uh, Dan, and Matt. And then uh, the more biological sorts in the team um, are Betsy DeMont, uh, Zara Dowling, my PhD student, and Mike Smotherman, Smotherman from uh, Texas A&M University. And my picture is not shown, otherwise it would break the PowerPoint. So. And here are our uh, project tasks that I'll just put up there uh, for you to uh, glance over. We're basically going to, um, in this project, characterize bat avoidance uh, responses to ultrasound. We're going to develop an initial biomimetic prototype, and I'll explain what we mean by that, um, and then develop a series of, of whistles that operate over a range of frequencies so that we can affect uh, various bat species, and then test this in the laboratory on bats, and then finally uh, test these on wind turbines. And so the first uh, task was to um, basically find a candidate biological model. So we looked at larynxes, uh, the voice box, of horseshoe bats, and also of concave-eared torrent frogs, the only amphibians that produce ultrasound. And we have done 3D scans of the larynx, basically looking for a biological model um, for our whistle that we want to attach along the length of a blade and basically have the wind passively blow these ultrasounds and keep the bats away from uh, the blades. So uh, there's a lot in this slide, but on the left-hand side you see a couple of uh, histological slides of basically the larynx um, of a uh, torrent frog and then um, the digitiz digitization of those by the engineers on the team. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, you see a couple of silicone um, versions of these whistles that we have, have tested. And then down below those uh, revolved and uniform whistles, uh, you just see kind of a miniature version of our test device, where we connect the, the whistle to our test device and record the sound um, on microphones in a um, small wind tunnel set up here at the University of Massachusetts. And I'll walk you through some of the uh, initial results um, for those prototype whistles. And you can see on the top colorful part of the figure um, the uh, production of ultrasound along the, um, the y-axis time on the x-axis. And then down below, you can see the um, the time and the wind speed or air speed that we're blowing through the whistle. And you can see the bright orange line in the upper part of the figure indicating that you know we're getting a, a really nice ultrasound close to um, um, 40 kilohertz, which is, which is fantastic. And a power level on the right-hand side um, uh, that can be heard uh, out 10 meters away from the uh, the blade at, at about 60 kil, um, uh, decibels. And 
another important uh, characteristic of these whistles is that we want them basically not to be a constant ultrasound, but for it to jump frequencies just as it does in a real bat or in a real frog. And we have been able to do that uh, with these um, uh, manufactured whistles. And you can see the, the orange line that suddenly jumps with just a, a small change in um, uh, pressure or uh, airspeed. And in the lower right-hand corner is just showing from a uh, publication of Soothers that when they run air through a real larynx of a torrent frog, um, that they get this jumping. And so that's what we're trying to imitate with these whistles, because it's found to be more effective in basically deterring bats. Um, so we um, have developed uh, several different whistles, a revolved whistle, an axially mirrored one, axially asymmetric. And uh, they produce ultrasound in over the range that we are interested in for a variety of different bat species. And now I'm going to take you to some of the tests on the bats. So this is, you know, there's the engineering perspective of producing something that, uh, a whistle that produces the ultrasound. And then uh, uh, Mike Smotherman that you see here uh, tests uh, bats and their response to ultrasound. And so he's been uh, testing so far Mexican free-tailed bats and tricolored bats. And he initially used three different assays, a Y maze, a perching assay, and what he calls a turning assay. And um, I will just walk you through these three different uh, test approaches that he uses and some of the results. So here's the Y maze approach. And you can see that he plays different um, computer-generated ultrasound. And there's, there's no effect. Um, Basically, the Y maze uh, test is just not effective because the, the bats, he said, appear to actually adapt to the, the ultrasound and become kind of immune to it. He said either that or he it wasn't playing irritating enough uh, ultrasound. But the Y maze was not an effective tool. So we have dropped that tool from uh, our testing. The perching assay, on the other hand, works quite well, where you basically give a, a bat an opportunity to perch on a, a quiet or on a ultrasound uh, perch. And you can see that there are four different um, uh, uh, medians and their uh, standard errors and confidence intervals uh, shown here. And on the left, you can see basically clicks. And um, on the right-hand side, those two are showing a perch with continuous white noise and a quiet one. So the ultrasound um, is affecting and keeping them away from perches, but it's even more effective when it's clicks versus just a constant white noise. Uh, when he does the tricolored bats, uh, likewise, he sees a very similar result with the perching assay. They respond and, and want to stay away from the ultrasound and do not uh, perch on those perches as readily. Turning assay is one that he um, really likes, and that is the can fly the, the bats um, down the tunnel. And the bats will trigger an ultrasound on either the left or right um, in a random fashion. And he can then measure the turn of that bat in response to it. And it's uh, really a great way to um, evaluate this. And again, with the speaker on producing ultrasound, uh, it definitely um, deters the bats. And when you look at but here is the complicating thing. And this is these are the tricolored bats. And there's no effect. With, and this is looking at the turning assay. And um, so there's a species-specific effect. The, these uh, tricolors are able to basically hover in front of the, of the noise, he said, in front of the uh, ultrasound, and don't seem to uh, be frightened. And they, they fly more slowly um, than the uh, free-tailed bats. And so I think we all just need to be aware that what solutions we come up with um, may only be species specific. So, OK, now I'm going to move back to the engineering perspective. And here are three engineers up at the top. And what we've been doing recently is looking at whether we can come up with these uh, various ultrasounds and the, the frequency modulation by uh, changing the te tension on polyethylene film. And this is the current experimental setup. And indeed, we can. Um, and we can basically um, 
change the airspeed going into the, uh, this whistle with a different uh, tension on that polyethylene uh, film. And we can get the jumping in frequency, uh, which is wonderful. Um, we basically stretch that polyethylene, um, various amounts here, 140% strain. And you can uh, change um, which frequencies are the uh, loudest. Uh, and you can also, if you keep that same tension but uh, monitored over a greater length of time, you can actually start to see jumping in frequency, just like in a, in a real larynx, which is fantastic. Uh, when you reduce the strain, um, to, uh, you basically lower the frequencies. If you increase the strain really highly, it just um, plates out, as they say, uh, in the engineering uh, biz, and you don't get the jumping at all. And so uh, in conclusion there, the complexity of the larynx geometry can be reduced to a tension film and flow. Um, the device produces ultrasound using flow-induced oscillations um, at frequency range and power desired. Uh, the tension is effective at controlling both harmonics and frequency. And we can get um, the decibel level we like out at five meters from the um, theoretical blade. We also think about how to mount these on the blade. So we've come up with um, housing for the blade. And on this figure, you can also see that um, you know, these units are very tiny um, compared to the size of a, a wind turbine blade. Uh, we've been doing modeling of wind speed um, in collaboration with John Perot here at the university uh, of wind speeds associated with uh, a certain type of wind turbine. This one is a NASA phase six rotor. Uh, we've also been doing the modeling of the um, airspeed on both the upwind and downwind side of the blades, various wind speeds, uh, distances off the blade, and so forth. Here you can see the um, downside um, of the blade um, and how the, the wind speed varies at different portions of that. And what we are thinking is that basically we can uh, get the frequency we want out of our whistles by positioning them according to wind speed along these blades. And let's see, I'm going to move on here just to show the, um, there's a lot of information here, but just to um, show that we've been modeling the, um, the complexity of the airspeed uh, at different points along the blade. And I will also show you that what we've been doing most recently is looking at flow concentrators that we can basically attach to the front of our whistles so that we can increase the velocity of airstream flow into our whistles to get them the, the airspeed at the optimum for whistles blowing at uh, different frequencies. So basically, in summary, we can uh, manipulate the frequency and the jumping of the frequency um, by the tension we put on the vibrating membrane in the whistles, we can influence the airspeed hitting that membrane using a concentrator and by the placement along different places on the blade that vary in airspeed. And so we have all these different ways to um, affect what the ultrasound is coming out of these whistles. And here is just kind of a conclusion summary here um, that the industrial scale turbine blade has local velocity magnitude appropriate for our devices. The exact velocity profile is installation dependent. Um, Cordwise velocity reductions can be compensated for by using flow concentrators. Flow separation is avoidable by placement uh, closer to the leading edge or on the upwind side of the blade. Um, and current peak acoustic output appropriate for array deployment along the blade. And our work is ongoing through this year. And um, we continue to uh, test. We've uh, now sent the uh, sound files from our whistles to Mike uh, Smotherman. And he will be testing those on his um, path in the lab and field this spring. 
and we have yet to do this, but we have uh, we will be recording sounds of these whistles on an actual turbine blade uh, in collaboration um, uh, with uh, Amherst College, which is nearby our campus, and they have a, a turbine that they have uh, are allowing us to use. And with that, yeah, I guess I'll thank all and uh, try to address any questions you might have. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we do have a number of questions coming in. We've had a couple of questions about um, whether other species can hear the whistles, um, and would there be any bother to, for example, dogs or livestock from the noise? So, um, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, and we um, aim all our, free, our, our ultrasound frequency ranges to be above 25 um, kilohertz outside the uh, hearing range of, of course, humans and dogs. Um, and so, uh, so it should not bother um, anything uh, but bats. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, you referenced the 60 decibel acoustic level measurement. How far away from the device did you measure that level? So we do all of our measurements in the lab um, at 25 centimeters away from the device itself, and then we project uh, what that sound would be at various distances from a theoretical blade. So we have not tested these on the blade, so we can't say from actual field experiments at all. Um, but our um, extrapolations indicate that we can get uh, 60 decibels out to um, 10 meters, I believe. Thank you. Um, and you showed a slide on where the whistles would be mounted on the blades. Could you just go back to that slide and and talk just a little bit about where the whistles will be mounted. OK. So, so um, this may or um, hopefully this slide will, will do. This just shows the variation in um, uh, flow velocity of different um, portions of a blade of a certain type of turbine. And what we would. Um, because we can change the frequency depending on the tension uh, of the membrane in our whistles, um, and we can also affect the airspeed going into those by placement in different airflows on the blade, and we can change the airflow going into a whistle by basically funneling air um, into the front of that whistle um, in what we call a concentrator, we basically would put these all the way from um, you know the base to the tip of the blade, and we could theoretically, though we haven't tested it on a real turbine, theoretically we could set those whistles to blow at frequencies commonly used by migratory bats or perhaps by um, you know myota species or or whatever, and we could uh, affect all that. Um, by, by where along the distance of the blade they are um, attached. These are all pretty small units, and so they are um, under 5 centimeters uh, in height. Probably the final housing may be more like 2.5 centimeters high. So these are small. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions about maintenance and the life cycle, so I'm going to sort of combine them into one question um, that you can talk about a little bit. We have a question, what is the life cycle of the whistles? What is the lifetime of the film? Um, does it need to be replaced? And would high wind speeds puncture the film? And what type of maintenance would be required? Would the whistles be removed in the winter, for example? Those are all extremely good practical questions that we uh, we worry about. but. Um, down the road for us anyway. So our first hurdle in this project was just um, trying to basically uh, appropriately model a larynx of a real animal, get ultrasound, get ultrasound to jump, uh, show that it actually can deter bats in a laboratory setting and also um, in the field in front of you know bat caves when the, when the bats are, are coming out. But the, the questions raised here are really good and are 
you know, are, are something to worry about because these are really small devices, and if some, you know, we may have to put some kind of a mesh on the front um, eventually in order to keep some, certain particulates out. Uh, we may have to think about, you know, um, freezing conditions. Of course, the bats are probably not going to be flying during those freezing conditions, but um, it, that's a legitimate uh, concern. The membrane is so thin, the durability will be an issue. And so those are all good engineering questions. Um, but uh, like I said, our first uh, hurdle, which we thought was e enough to um, try to um, take on in this project is, is just getting them to mimic the production of ultrasound and show that it can deter. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and how many whistles would be installed per blade? Yeah, so if, uh, I mean, a good question. Uh, again, we're not that far down uh, that road, but I'll uh, think out loud and, you know, if these things can produce uh, sound, which uh, is a deterrent maybe up to 10 meters away from the whistle itself, uh, you probably want them to overlap just for safety reasons in terms of keeping the bats away. Uh, maybe every five meters, the full length um, of the blade would be one possibility, so that you have plenty of overlap. Um, but again, you know, actually, I will be quite honest, uh, we haven't even had that discussion yet um, with uh, the engineers, but it is a really good question. Thank you. Um, we had a couple questions come in about whether you've modeled of uh, any potential energy loss as a result of installing the whistles. Um, does the potential loss change based on where along the blade the whistle is deployed? So have you done any modeling or predictions about that? Um, I personally have not, but Matt Lackner is uh, the, uh, the faculty member here who gives us advice and helps with the modeling on that part. And um, as long as we stay, according to him, under five centimeters in height, um, they are not going to change the flow over these blades and should have no effect on the efficiency of the, um, the turbine itself. And so. Um, if more detail is needed, I may have to uh, direct uh, the questioner um, to Matt. OK, thanks. Um, so the couple of people who had those questions, you can let me know in the Q&A box if you'd like to follow up with Paul and um, have him put you in touch with Matt. The next question asks about um, where you'd indicated that 61 decibels was achieved at a distance of five meters from the blade. Is that sufficient distance to allow bats to avoid blade strikes and or barotrauma? Um, we hope so. Uh, we have not done that test either. And uh, so down the, the road, that is the ultimate test uh, to sh actually show that you can reduce mortality in the field. And is we are hoping five meters is enough. Um, there is some literature to indicate that that should be a, enough to um, turn them away with, um, without being taken up into the, uh, any vortexes surrounding the blades. But it's, you know, I must say, I think it's still fairly speculative. Um, so I can't give a firm answer to that, that question. And, and I look forward to actually, or myself or someone else, uh, doing those studies um, down the line. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have time for one last question, which is, what does the directivity pattern look like from the whistles? Ooh, I bet that means uh, how that the sound is spreading out from the whistle. Um, yeah, we have not measured that yet. We are just um, measuring, a, we have the microphone in a single location. Um, in line with the whistle, and so I can't answer that one yet either. We have not uh, modeled the, di the directivity, if I understand the question correctly. All right, um, and then one last thing came in here. Do you have a product name yet for the whistle? <laughs> no. Um, um, yeah, I've never uh, produced such a product before, and I haven't. Uh, but I haven't come up with a name, and or we haven't come up with a name. So uh, open to creativity. Uh, creativity when it comes to naming. 
All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and that brings us to the end of our time. Um, for those of you who ask questions that we were not able to get to, again, we'll follow up with the speakers by email and try and get back to you on those. A reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted later this week on the NWCC website. And another reminder that we have another presentation, another webinar in this same series on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern um, for the two projects under this funding opportunity that are in the higher TRL category. So please join us for that webinar if you are able. And thank you, everyone. Um, that brings us to a close. So thanks and goodbye. <laughs>